Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Uplifting Impact Podcast. My name is Deanna Singh. I'm the Chief Change Agent here at Uplifting Impact, and I'm so excited to welcome you to another deep dive in our journey to make the world a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive place. Today, I am talking with Deepa Pershafman, and I am very excited about talking to her because she has such an amazing story. So Deepa was the first senior partner at Deloitte, where she spent more than 20 years focusing on women's leadership and inclusion strategies. She was also the first Indian American woman and one of the youngest people to make partner in the firm's history. After leaving Deloitte in 2020, Deepa founded In Formation, a membership-based community for professional women of color, offering brave, safe, and new spaces for helping women place, uh, for helping, excuse me, place women of color in C suite positions and on boards. Deepa's book, The First, The Few, The Only How Women of Color Can Redefine Power in Corporate America, was published by HarperCollins on March 1st, 2022. And we get the pleasure of having her here with us today. Welcome, Deepa. Thank you for having me. So excited to be here. Absolutely. So this is a topic that has been near and dear to my heart for a really long time because I have been asked so many times over the years for recommendations or, you know, have been approached because people are telling me how much they're struggling to find uh, women and women of color to, to join their boards. And it's always just been kind of um, disconcerting for me because Mm -hmm. every time I hear that, I'm like, what do you mean? There are so many people who would be so uh, great at being able to be in these roles. And so it's always kind of perplexed me, right? Why is there this clearly this demand that I'm hearing about it all of the time, but on the other side, why are people saying that they're struggling? And so when I saw that this is what you were doing and, and where you're focusing your time and your attention, I just, like I told you before we got on the interview, I was like, we have to talk. We, I have to, she has the answers. I have to talk to her so I can, I can answer these people when they keep coming to me. So welcome to the show. Thank now give me you. all the answers. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> well, it's funny. Like that actually I have an answer for, uh, there may be other things you asked me that I don't have an answer for, but you know, in, in the first chapter of the book, I talk about delusions and I talk about things that we believe about corporate America or the workplace or, you know, even things we've been taught that we have just been taught are kind of the gold standard or how it is. And the first delusion I open the book with is this idea that there, we can't find you, that, you know, you don't exist. Um, and part of the research that I've done over the last few years, and, and this is not new, right? This is not my own individual research, but is that we tend to um, gravitate towards people who look like us. And that is true of our friends. Friends, that's true of where we live, but it's also true of our networks. If you look at LinkedIn or you know your other your other business networks, and so yeah, it doesn't surprise me that the people saying that to you are probably white leaders sitting in those roles because their networks look like them, and so they don't know where to find people like you and I. But if I ask you or if you ask me, I have hundreds, right, or if not thousands, because our networks look different. And so there's a there's almost like a supply demand challenge in the system and in the structure and in the process that's actually causing that divide. It's not actually that we don't exist; it's that people don't know how to find us. I think it's a different issue. You know, I really love that you reframed it that way because that is one of the things that I try to uh, really emphasize with people all of the time is if you are looking for something and you can't find it, and but then you keep going back to the same place and looking in the same place mm-hmm. and then saying, well, throwing up my hands, I can't find it, mm-hmm. can't find it. But no, have you changed anywhere that you've looked? Have you asked anybody new? Have you tried to like broaden uh, the, the spaces where you might be able to find it? And I, I'm always just so shocked. People are like, oh no, I didn't think about that. <laughs> Yes. Well, then we can't have different expectations if we're doing exactly. the same behaviors, right? Different exactly. for outcomes. Okay. So I really want to dive I- into the book um, just a little bit more. So we'd really love to hear maybe just an overview, if you could share with us, we understand how you start it by busting yeah. our delusions, but then what are some of the other things that happen throughout the, throughout the book? You know, the book is really trying to talk about the things that we're taught, whether they, those are about the system or whether, you know, things that we are taught individually. So I do have a couple of chapters that talk about things that women of color are taught as little girls, right? The things that we believe for ourselves about leadership or even about what we think is possible for ourselves. And so it's a lot of, you know, how do you rewrite messages that don't serve us? How do we really create a new narrative and a new path for us? Because I think the ones that are around us, I never saw myself on television. I never saw myself in my teachers. I literally never saw myself anywhere. So in order for me to get to where I got, I had to really kind of rewrite my own narratives, but we don't often teach people that. 
So that's a lot of what the initial, the early parts of the book are about. The middle parts of the book is really talking about how the experience of women of color is really different. You know, we like another delusion we hold up is that corporate America is a meritocracy. And what I really wanted to blow open is the fact that it's not a meritocracy. It shows up differently for different groups of people. And it's okay to talk about that. There really hasn't been space to talk about that, but we can't change it. We can't make it better. We can't appreciate or walk in other people's shoes if we don't understand that it actually is different. And so I go through things like there is an extra job in the job for women of color. We get asked to do so many extra unpaid things, so many things people don't even understand. And I list things like that out. I also talk about the ways in which the process doesn't actually allow us to speak our mind or talk about racism. There's actually the system itself and the structure and the reporting mechanisms don't actually support that. And then the last part of the book, I'm really talking about how we step into our group power because part of this work, I think, is figuring out for yourself, how do you find power for you when you don't see it around you and how do you rewrite your own narratives? But in order to make structural change and really you know, create a movement around this, we have to do it together. So I call that the power of me and then the power of we. And so that's really what um, information of my collective work is about is like, I can help you figure it out for yourself, but it's really hard to do this work by yourself. And so we need to find each other. You know, I think uh, this whole idea around meritocracy is one that I wish we did have more conversations, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, about, because I, I think that it's one of those things that when I talk to other people of color, especially when I talk to other women of color and I say like, do you remember when you realized that it wasn't a meritocracy? Mm-hmm. Like, do you remember that moment? We can almost always point to not just one moment, but mm-hmm. multiple moments Correct. in our career where we real we, we step back and we're like, Oh wait, I thought we were all playing the same game here. Yes. And I realized I'm not even on the board right? I'm not even on the right board for the game that's being played um, around me. And like how disheartening that is, I think. Um, And then also how much I think that gets escalated because it's disheartening, but you also feel like you don't have anybody to talk to about it, right? Like there is no, there is no kind of platform for that. So no, no, that's I, exactly true. I mean, that's exactly right. It's interesting. So I interviewed 500 women of color in writing the book. And what I found is there was a group of them that had really stepped into their power. And when I say power, I'm, you know, it's going to be different for different women, but full voice, like knew who they were, were clear, kind of lived their life by the, the things that they believed for themselves. And those women in almost all cases had faced a life event. So whether that was health related, whether that was a divorce, um, in a lot of cases, it was a work discriminatory issue or something like the system just didn't show up for them in the way that they thought it would. And it makes you question your values. It makes you question everything you've been taught. It makes you question all the sacrifices you've made. And if I keep doing it the same way and the system actually isn't fair or it's showing up differently for me, do I believe all those things I was taught? And so that's actually when I think we end up really growing in a lot of ways and questioning the delusions around us and doing things differently. I guess my question back to you is, and I'm, I, I'm going to make an assumption here, but this is probably where information like started, mm-hmm. but how do we do that without having a tragic life event, right? Like how yeah. do we sur- get to that moment without yeah. people having to have that experience before they feel like they can step into their power? You know, in all candor, I feel like everyone's in that moment as a result of the last few years. I think, you know, part of what is so fascinating about uh, the company and the book in this time that it's come out and because it's something, you know, I felt like was going really slow, but it's happened really quickly, is that I feel like the moment has met some of this conversation. So I think everyone, you know, across the planet is asking themselves, what is the space I want work to take up in my life? Like last few years have shown us how much, you know, um, work is broken and workplaces are broken and the ways in which we work are even broken. And so I I actually think um, other than, you know, in some ways, I guess COVID was everyone's big life event is what is a little bit of what I'm saying, but I think everyone's asking these questions in a different sort of way. We've been set up in this culture where you sacrifice who you are and what you are in your health and, and your family time to get ahead. And I think everyone's just starting to unpack that and say, is that really healthy? Is that really how we want to live anymore and how we want to work anymore? Yeah. I, I remember there was, um, I, I talk about multiple of these instances too, and in some of the, the writings that I've done, but I remember there was this moment where somebody said to me, like, I'm not going to die for this, right? Like, mm-hmm. this is not going to kill me. And mm-hmm. like, that was my wake up moment. Mm-hmm. And I think that what people don't understand when we talk about inclusion or we talk about exclusion is that it's not like, oh, you know, people just are not kind or it's not, no, there is real mental and physical and physiological things that are mm-hmm. happening as a result of people being excluded, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Because you're working hard. In most cases, you're working 
twice as hard or three right. times as hard, but you're not seeing the same kinds of rewards, but you're being told it's something different than what it really is. And I mean, it just creates havoc in our, yeah. in our, in our, in our lives. No, it's, that's absolutely true. So, you know, I, I do lay out some of the things and the the stories that a lot of the women of color were taught. And there are slight like, differences based on where you grew up and your background, but there were a lot of commonalities. And the biggest one was, right, you have to work harder or do more just to, just to get ahead. And so we've already been set up in a situation where we're working, overworking ourselves, right? Uh, the most hands down surprising thing I found in my research is that almost every woman of color, so two out of three women of color I interviewed were sick, like you're describing, and not sick with, you know, a can cancer diagnosis, which is clearly diagnosable, but these, what I call mysterious illnesses. So skin rashes, hives, headaches, fertility issues, stomach pains, heart palpitations, things they suffered in, you know, with for a couple of years and a lot of doctors dismissed. And to fast forward, I mean, I ended up meeting with a lot of psychologists and doctors. And part of what's happening is women of color are not being seen and heard in structures. They're muting themselves. They're erasing parts of themselves. They are suffering through uh, things like racism and, and microaggressions and all of that. And, and, up till very, very recently told they don't even exist, right? So it's almost a little bit of gaslighting and crazy making. And those things manifest in your body. And so, yes, that is actually the finding from the book. And so it's a little bit of, you can sacrifice your power. You can keep emulating other people. You can give up, you know, your choices as you rise in an attempt to conform, to belong. But what ends up happening is ultimately it will catch up with you, whether it's in your physical body or at the end of your career. A lot of the women of color I interviewed looked back and were regretful about how much they edited themselves because they believed once they got to the seat, they would do it their way. And in all candor, there's actually less ability to do it your way once you get to that senior level, because there's more expectations on you. And so, yes, it's a, it's a really interesting setup that again, we're not taught about and we don't talk about. And so you end up navigating on your own. Uh, and part of information is having these kinds of conversations out in the open. So you can actually be proactive about it and have agency around it. Uh, no, I, I feel, I don't know if you know that song, you know, singing my song, uh, I can't, now I can't think of the lyric, uh, <laughs> through her words. I, I can't think of the lyrics, but essentially it's like, I feel like you're singing my song, right. Mm -hmm. And, and not just my song, me as an individual, but singing my song, you know, as women of color, right. We, we, we see it happening all of the time. Um, and it's really powerful to be able to have now an amazing resource that we can point yeah. people to and show like, this yeah. is real. This is, this is something that's happening to you. And this is something that you can do. These are the things that you can do that are preventable. So my question to you is for the people who are listening and really want to be able to combat some of the things that we're talking about, what would you recommend uh, that they do? How, how can people get activated so that they can help uh, eliminate all these things that we're, that we're talking about here? Yeah, I think the first part, a lot of this work is about permission, right? It's about permission to really let yourself understand that this, there's a system operating around you, you know, almost like water that we are, you know, taking in if we're fish and we don't even understand that it's there, right? It's just part of the air we, you know, breathe and part of the water we're, we're swimming in. And so understanding, getting smarter about some of the challenges and some of the dynamics, which is part of why I do this work and I do the research in particular. I think showing women of color that um, the system has certain uh, behaviors, I think is really important because so many, so many of us carry imposter syndrome and things that we think are really about us when it's actually the system. And I'm happy to, to kind of unpack that a little bit. Um, but part of what this work is about is really figuring out for yourself, what are your boundaries? Like what is important to you? How do you want to show up? And what I find is it's not, you know, hundreds of things for most women of color. It's usually six or 10 things that are really important to who they are and their voice and how they want to show up in the world. And they just need to be more conscious of it so that in moments where you're asked to compromise on those things, you can say no, and here's why and how you do that. That. So that's really the first part. I think the second part is finding community, whether that is through things like information or your local church group or whatever that is. You know, I even tell women just have, find three other women and keep them on like a, a, a group chat, you know, um, for when a microaggression or racist incident happens, because it will. And we tend to hold on to negative comments four times as long as we, we hold on to positive comments. So finding a way to process it, having a group where you can say, this just happened to me. This guy just said something that was so horrible. What do you all think? What should I say? What should I do? Like what, you know, just even being able to talk about it helps you release. And so I think those are the most important things, but it's a little bit of getting educated. So, you know, the, the most surprising thing about this work is how many women of color think it's them. 
And part of what we need to realize is it's not us. And once you know it's not you and you're not alone, it's very freeing. And then the work is a lot easier. It almost comes your way. But up till now, we've kind of not even been seeing the cues. We've not been seeing the signals because we've been taught just work harder and they don't exist. And so that's really my general advice at a high level. So help me understand information, you know, because if people are thinking that that might be a good community for them, I'd love for you to just give us some some idea of what that looks like to join the community, what, you know, what happens in the community. Um, you know, you, you go to information, you would sign up for the wait list. We are through, a, we're doing a process where we actually interview every person and it's less about qualifications and background and more about making sure that people can hold space. Everything mm-hmm. we're doing is virtual. And so having women that can help uh, make space for other women is really important. Um, just having language to have some of these hard conversations is really important. Um, what we usually do, and, and we are in the process of figuring out, you know, a better cadence, we're a year old. And so uh, we have realized that, you know, women are tired and we need to find the right kind of uh, frequency for some of what we do. But we start the top of the month with a conversation around um, like a, a leadership concept or something that we want to share with the group. And so, you know, some of the things we're talking about now are pieces of research we shared with the group, or we'll bring in an outside speaker. And it's almost where we're sharing something that is different for us as women of color. At the end of the month, we hold space 90 minutes where we actually have what we call a safe space conversation. So when Naomi Osaka left the French Open, we had a big conversation about what does that mean for self-care and what does that mean for us? Just a few months ago, we had a huge conversation as a group. Uh, some of our white passing Latino women said that they struggled with the term women of color. And so, you know, can we, can we talk about that as a group? And so with 70 of us, we talked about different kinds of women of color, what that meant to us and where are are our synergies and where are our differences. And so it's this really, I think, unique space where we're having conversations about race and gender that I have not seen anywhere else. Uh, Most of us have never met each other. And so it's really fascinating, which is why it's, it's important to kind of have a curated space. Um, but it is safe. It is different. And it, it is these really provocative conversations that I think help liberate people from, from what they think they have to believe to what they can believe about themselves. That is so incredibly awesome. And then are you also supporting, um, you know, these organizations who say we can't find people? Are you also helping in yes. some of the, the recruiting side? Yeah, we soft launched uh, an initiative a couple of weeks ago, and there's going to be much more announcement about it in the, in the months to come. But we are launching a large uh, board initiative. So it's called 100 Women, 100 Women of Color. And we're going to place 100 Women of Color on boards uh, in particular, but it also will extend to the C-suite over the next few years. We're doing that in partnership with some very large organizations, because I think there's a lot of effort to put people of color on boards or to put women on boards. And a lot of the interventions that are happening are helping more white women get on boards, but women of color haven't really uh, been as advantaged from those interventions. And so it's a little bit more of a concerted effort. And we are really excited to do that because part of this is also recognizing that as women of color, we have really unique lived experiences that we bring to the table. And so how do we even change the criteria for what it means to be board ready? Because I think we're board ready, but we kind of, again, the process we use is broken. And so it's really kind of reframing some of that and providing new ways of looking at that. That is amazing. So I, I, I think you're going to have a lot of people who are going to sign up for interviews, um, <laughs> which is, which is great. Yes, and I hope we will take them. all, yes. I hope that you will all go and, uh, consider purchasing the book too, because again, it's the kind of knowledge that I think will one, if you are a woman of color, give you some peace, right. About maybe some of the things that you've been struggling with and some of the words that you can even use to explain some of your own experiences, not feel so alone. But I think it's also really important if you're not a woman of color to pick up the book so that you get a sense of what is happening and what their experiences are like, you know, too often we live in our own bubbles and we think that everybody sees the world through the same lenses that we do. And when you realize that they don't, right, we, we aren't all seeing it through. We are, our social identities play a large part and yeah. how we experience our day to day, that's when you can have real transformative experiences. That's where real empathy comes from. That's where authenticity, uh, being authentic, right, comes from because yeah. you put yourself in a position to change the lenses that you that you kind of tend to normally always wear. Absolutely. I, th- I think that's also been what's most surprising for me. I wrote the book for women of color, thinking that that is who would pick it up. And it's actually been a lot of white leaders and white male leaders in particular who are picking up the book. A lot of co- companies actually already calling saying, we want to do better. We don't know exactly how it's different. Like we're open to the fact that it is, but no one has ever explained to us in detail what it looks like. And so I have the story is to prove that it's different and it's happening everywhere. So yes, if you are a co-conspirator or other words, other people use the word ally, I think it's also important to understand. So you can help. That is so incredibly amazing. So now people want the book. They're going to want to sign up. 
Tell yeah. us how they do all of that. What's the, yeah. how do they get so the best? It? The best way to, would be to go to my website. So Deepa Peru, D-E-E-P-A-P-U-R-U.com. We have information about the book and kind of speaking and all the things we're doing around that area. And then we also have information about information where you can sign up and get to the wait list and get to the website. Fantastic. Well, I just want to say thank you so very much for holding this really special place for people to be able to have these conversations, to learn all of this information. You know, we only can get better and, and stronger the, by learning, right? We can only get better and stronger by having more access to some of these opportunities to see what the lived experience look like. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for making Absolutely. space where we can have this, these kinds of discussions. Yeah. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. I, I can't wait to talk to our listeners about, about your book and the things that they learn from it after they get a chance to read it. So just want to say to everyone who has joined us today, we appreciate having you here on another week's episode of Uplifting Impacts podcast. We know that in order to have real impact, we need more people. We need more people who are engaged. We need more people who are ready, who have the information and the knowledge, who are hungry to make a change. So please feel free to share this episode. Please feel free to go ahead and leave your comments or suggestions for other people that we should invite onto the podcast at our website, upliftingimpact.com, or feel free to connect to us right on LinkedIn directly. Uh, you can either connect with myself or my co-host, Justin Ponder. We love hearing from you. So until next week, keep on uplifting the impact. Thanks. Thanks.